a, a button. So we are, we are now live. We can wait a, a minute or two for people to, uh, to join. <clears throat> And uh, uh, so how will so, I share my screen? Uh, you will uh, uh, just now. Uh, sorry, uh, now I lost. Uh, sorry, I, I stopped sharing mine now. We can wait uh, uh, another 30 seconds that people uh, keep joining us. <clears throat> and I see we have some very prominent people in the audience this morning. Uh, and and then uh, and then we, we start. Maybe we wait until 31, <laughs> 731. Okay. Uh, and uh, no, people are still are still joining. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that's excellent. Okay, okay. And, and and Simon, you are okay if we record the talk and then share it in our YouTube channel. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay, okay. It's seven thirty-one. So good morning, <clears throat> uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of uh, of Data at Breakfast. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and today. Uh, we have a very topical uh, subject <laughs> in the data breakfast because everybody is suffering from load shedding today or this week. Yeah, so let's see how what we can do to 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 change it in future. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, organized a kind of a mini series on 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 the topic, uh, starting today with uh, with Professor Simon Connell. Uh, who is um, based at the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment of the University of, of, of Johannesburg. <clears throat> and Simon is, uh, I think, by, by, by training a, a particle and nuclear physicist, but he has also lots of uh, interest in, uh, in, in high performance computing, material science, and, and, and applied, uh, uh, applied physics. Yeah? Uh, he's a past president of the South African Institute uh, uh, of Physics. And, uh, and he's a member of the Atlas collaboration at, uh, at CERN and, and, and I think was instrumental for South Africa to take part into, uh, into that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, I, I quickly mentioned the, 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 the mini series and then I deviated with the, with the bio of Professor Connell. Uh, next week we will have uh, Jared Wright uh, as a speaker and you see him in the, <clears throat> uh, in the, among the, the, the panelists at the top of your screen probably. And, uh, and he will speak next week and maybe present uh, a slightly different opinion to the one that, uh, uh, that Simon will present today. So Simon, <clears throat> we are very happy that you are with us this, this morning and uh, we are looking forward to hear how you want to bring us back electricity. You're welcome to start sharing uh, the screen uh, and begin with your presentation. <clears throat> And please, to the participants, while Simon shares the, 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 the presentation, make use of the Q&A facility uh, to ask questions. And Professor Conrad and, uh, and Dr. Wright will, um, will moderate the, 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 the question session after, uh, after Simon's talk. So Simon, please, over, over to you. <clears throat> I just want to know if you can see my screen. Yes, if you can go press the full, uh, presentation mode, full screen mode, that would be better. So we don't see the, ah, fantastic. Okay. Now we are in business. Okay. Yeah, okay. perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. Excellent. And then firstly, to say good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And the slides that I will present, I give the credits. Everyone who has contributed to the slides. And we have a group, which we call the Nexus Group. And we focus in one of the things on nuclear energy. I believe, of course, that nuclear energy is very, very important. And I want to say um, it's, it's difficult when you're being pro something to not come across as anti something. And, and so if I can really just establish that I'm restricting my comments to what we call base load or dispatchable power and not to uh, the entire mix, the entire energy mix. So there, of course, there will be renewables, there will be batteries, but I want to give a new view on renewables and batteries in how I talk about the requirements. So, so it may come across that I'm anti them, but uh, I would like everyone who believes strongly in renewables and batteries to 
nonetheless feel that there's room. So in setting the scene, I want to just say we need a lot of energy. When you have a more developed society, you need exponentially more energy. And, and this is just a point I, I will imagine it's established. I, I will imagine that we don't think we can simply save ourselves by saving 10% here, energy saver bulb there and so on. We need 10, 100 times more energy. And this is if we really want a developed society. So we also going to a stage where we believe in Africa. So we don't want Africa forever in the third world. If Africa is going to also itself take its place as a global contributor to the economy and so on, then we need to look at opportunities for Africa. Okay. And and there are um, beliefs in nuclear and there are politics actually in the energy system, beliefs and, 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 and politics. And these um, conversations, they, they need to really be challenged. Um, something we like to call the emperor's new clothes. So, so people talk about a new grid, an old grid. Um, we need to see what really is the evidence? Actually, we need to look at numbers. So one of the things is that the old grid, the conservative grid should be uh, highly centralized, expensive, inefficient, badly run because of bureaucratic state control. And the new grid will be distributed, deregulated, renewable, friendly, green, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that could be the beliefs that people have. But when we actually look at the grid with data, okay, we see the so-called duck curve. I've shown you a duck here. It's got a head, a back which is lower, and a tail which is higher. And that's the daily shape. And then uh, that it will be lower in the middle of the day and higher in the mornings and evenings. So you will generally see a duck curve. Now the, the black here would be the demand and the red would be what renewables would provide and the, the um, blue could be what you would need to provide. So the more penetration of renewables that you have, the more you have this very, very high variability. Now, again, if we come back to numbers, how should we understand that variability? It can vary on a seconds, minutes, hours, and days timescale on all of them. And some of them are very, very hard to meet because to, to fill in the gaps, you would, you would have to supply energy with a, a very rapid change. The, the seconds and even minutes time scale, when there's a large amount of what are called big rotating machines, that can be met simply by the inertia in those machines. There's not yet a device commercially available that can do what a big rotating machine can do in terms of that fast switching on a grid scale. You can build it in a lab on a small scale, but such a device does not yet exist on a large scale. Meaning to say, if you have a large penetration of renewables, there is a corresponding strain on the grid. The, the machines which have to take up the, the short term uh, variability, they have to thermal cycle and they start to age extremely fast. So I think this, this is a um, picture which talks about the variability, the intermittency and the dispatchability. It comes particularly from renewables. Okay, so, um, 
we we have now um, a concept that the central planning is inherently inefficient. Now, what we'd like to say here is we need a vision that's something of at least 100 years. You have got uh, machines that are going to last 100 years. There's elements of the grid that last that long. There's, there's transformers that last that long. There, there, there are even power stations that are lasting 40 years, 60 years, and now 80 years. And I'm talking about the nuclear power stations. There are other power stations which are claimed by their proponents to last 25 years. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So if you don't have a 100 year planning cycle, you are not going to be able to properly account for all of these time scales in your financial models. So um, we, we need to now um, look at this whole matter differently, okay? So one of the aspects here is to, to separate generation, transmission, and distribution. Another aspect is to compare apples with apples. So far we have the levelized cost of energy. And another aspect is what are the playing fields in terms of the roll out of renewable energy? So I just want to mention um, some things to take into account there. For example, generation, transmission and distribution. It's like you buy a four by four car and you say you are now off road. You do drive on the road sometimes, but mostly you drive off-road. Also, in the shop are goods from trucks that hold the, the goods there using the road. So you may be off-road, maybe you never drive on the road because you have your four by four, but you live in a society whereby you're consuming goods and, and accessing resources and services which still use the road. So the grid is like that. It's, it brings electricity with transmission and distribution to other aspects of society that you still use. If everyone does rooftop solar and does not pay uh, any grid fee, then we no longer will have a grid. Then we would have to all essentially be a completely independent island. So this is the aspect and how often may you need the grid? So if, if we do look at load shedding, it can have been something like 1% drop in power in the whole year. If, if, if you, instead of looking at load shedding in a time window as short, let's say as, um, let's say a day where you lost it for eight hours, if you go over to a year, on average, in the worst parts of load shedding, the worst years, we lost a um, power on average in South Africa over a year for one minute, which means that, sorry, for 1%, which means that 1% hurts, okay? And that means if the renewables don't produce for 1% of the time, of course, they won't produce for much more than that. It's already going to hurt. You already need backup. You either need storage or you need the grid. So you will need the grid actually 100% of the time at the time you have that 1% loss. And this means that the variability hurts much more than we think it hurts. The variability even if it is as low as 1% taking load shedding as a variability, even if it's as low as 1%, it still hurts. Okay, then if we look at the concept of sovereign guarantee that, that one can now have, um, it means you no, no longer have a pure market-driven system because you are guaranteeing a supplier who is going to install generation, you, you, you are guaranteeing that supplier a certain fixed cost over, let's say, 20 years. The problem if, of that is 
it's it's almost like a state-owned enterprise again because that's essentially what happens with the state-owned enterprise if there's a, another windmill available in five years time which is 10 percent more efficient you can't use that you are locked in with a certain payment plan to a certain supplier for a long time of the order of 20 years so sovereign guarantees are not the kind of thing you're going to find normally in business and they do lock you into a certain technology and a certain cost and they remove the so-called nimbleness that you may have thought the renewable energies were providing okay then the other thing is the intelligent grid uh, using ai using uh, big data sensing all over the grid understanding the demand and the supply everywhere and that would need a very very fast switching that would need dual circuits in every household for dirty and clean energy and those don't exist yet we are some time away from when we can have those and here i just show you a picture of the big rotating machines and this is basically the generators and now um, let's look at um, storage so the lead acid battery is invented in 1859 there is still a lead acid battery in our car there is of course much more advanced batteries but they remain expensive and they remain still only slightly more efficient and we can ask ourselves how much more efficient can a battery be we could also have pumped storage so these are the two kinds of storages we could imagine uh, a, a vast proliferation of batteries and we could imagine pumped storage and i just want you to reflect a moment uh, if we consider cape town and it's got Coburg nearby and let's suppose that was renewable and let's suppose that it was two gigawatts and then it needed to store two gigawatts for six hours or for 12 hours and you can do the conversion it is about 10 to 20 tons kilotons of tnt i don't want to frighten you to say i'm actually talking of it as a bomb i just want you to appreciate the energy content that you have to store people don't easily think about numbers the amount of energy that the renewable power station or nuclear power station is delivering when you take power times time you have to get energy how much is that energy how do we help our imagination think about that energy it's a few percent of hiroshima per day this is the kind of energy that we're talking about and just want you to think a bit about that there's the black swan safety thinking in terms of a, a um, nuclear energy where you think about any accident that can happen no matter the logical pathway to get there if it's a scenario you cannot conceive how you will get to that scenario it is a black swan safety thinking now if we would apply black swan thinking to the storage we would have to imagine that there could be an accident so please keep in mind the amount of energy that you're talking of for storage it's it's a, it's a, it's an enormous amount of energy which is why you end up thinking about a scenario of pure load following that is to say energy on the scale of what a city consumes in 12 hours should not ever be stored you don't want to be storing that amount of energy going into a future where we want 10 times as much energy even more so you only want to produce energy as and when you need it you want to do this thing called um, uh, um load following okay now um over here in this um picture we try to uh, compare the reliance of a given modality on the grid and 
uh, you find uh, in this diagram on the right that the renewables rely more strongly on the grid than do the uh, modalities that are capable of load following. So basically, uh, the, the um, renewables have to do a thing called handover. They like to feel that they're on a copper plate. When the sun shines there and not here, a cloud is there and not there, the wind blows here and not there, and so on, the renewables have to do handover. So the renewables are much heavier users of the grid. Now, when you think about renewables, you also have to think about what is the status of the grid? Is it this copper plate? In Europe, where it is thought to be a copper plate, do they suffer from handover? In actual fact, when you do look at the numbers, this is the case. And so I just want to say once again, you come to the conclusion that you do you do not want to do um, uh, a, a lot of handover. Uh, this is again um, show, showing this. So, so many, many people have come to, to, to this uh, conclusion. Now, here we look at a graph of how much power Africa has, and it's really incredibly low compared to um, other countries, for example, Asia and the Pacific. And in this, um, we, we look at the energy co consumption per capita. And again, you find Africa is hardly colored in. So when you do reduce this now to numbers, as you have seen from that curve, then you would come to the conclusion that if we wanted to bring Africa to the same stage as the rest of the world, we will need about 20 times more power. So South Africa has got uh, 30, uh, 40 uh, gigawatts. And you can imagine, uh, you know, the scale up and the scale up all around. And you can imagine that you would want to address this gigawatts, uh, this actually terawatts, you would want to address it with an amount of, of energy in terms of generation which also goes to terawatts. So if we're going to go to terawatts, we must scale everything that goes into generation, the consumption of natural resources, availability of those, safety at that scale, the environment sustainability at that scale, the dispatchable component of the power and the storage. And in this um, graph, I just want to compare now, I'm doing it for fossil fuels versus nuclear, but you can actually think about this concept, which is the diffuseness of supply. There's 200 MeV per atom for uh, nuclear, and then you can see in the ranges of EV per atom for the fossil um, fuels. You can also think of a moving air mass, what is the diffuseness of supply? You can think of uh, sunlight and what is the diffuseness of supply? And it's essentially going to be that um, one will need to look at how much energy um, you need and what amount of plant you will need to harvest it. To try to appreciate this, um, again, to do the comparison in terms of fossil, because we, we need imagination to help our mind cope with these numbers. The, um, the energy content in, in a nuclear energy is so absolutely dense. It will scale everything. It will scale the amount of fuel. So that fuel becomes a small fraction of the cost. Likewise, waste. Likewise, the amount of plant required for the power station. And here is just to say the effects of such scaling. If, again, if we would compare to fossil, um, even if you had one ppm of, of a radioactive species in coal, which, which is the case, because you need of the order of tens and hundreds of millions of times more coal, that small amount of radioactivity in coal becomes more 
than in nuclear in such a way that the radioactive release from fossil fuels is also um, a problem. So, so now let's just compare these actually in terms of the generation capacity. So, so obviously for hydro, you need a river and you have a capacity factor of 40%. For wind and solar, um, you, you need um, a large amount of plant to harvest it. You have also a low capacity factor and you have a certain lifetime. Nuclear, on the other hand, dense form of energy, very flexible location and size, uh, Cuba going on to 60 year life extension, other power stations going on to 80 year life extension, very high capacity factor. And now uh, to try and do that comparison in terms of diffuseness of supply, we're going to look at uh, the extreme examples that, that, that help us the biggest dam in the world and uh, 22.5 gigawatts. So dams are very interesting in that they can really provide an enormous amount of power, but then they occupy an enormous area and then you find a very low power per kilometer squared. Again, we can do that for solar. And again, a similar low power per kilometer squared. We can go also to the largest wind installation and it's an even lower power per kilometer square. Now, when you come to nuclear, uh, you also of course need plant and exclusion zone, but you do again come to a much higher power per kilometer square. Here is the um, summary and the take home message is nuclear is the most dense source of power. And I just want to say that, that that means that it's going to require the least plant. It's going to make the smallest amount of waste. It's going to use the least amount of energy. It's going to have the most flexible location. So, Again, now we come to cost and, and I've really got this picture just to say, I prefer myself that this cost argument, it's highly overrated. At the moment, uh, the minister has said Kubo costs 45 cents per kilowatt hour. People within Kubo are saying the direct cost is 20 cents per kilowatt hour. At the moment, this is the cost of Kubo. At the moment, all the so-called nuclear nightmares are included in that cost. So return to Greenfield by 2024 will be fully paid up. The cost of um, final disposal of the waste and the cost of insurance of any kind of activity uh, uh, accident are all in that cost in some way. In, in some of them, the ways it's, a, it's written as a liability, but it is in the cost. So everything that you, you may worry about for nuclear is inside that 45 cents per kilowatt hour. What are we paying right now is around a rand a kilowatt hour. What are renewables claiming they can be affordable at in terms of generation only, no, no distribution, no transmission, is in the 80 cents a kilowatt hour. So whatever anyone wants to argue, if you go and look at the numbers, you find a story that you have to still explain. The cost of electricity in Germany went up as their reliance on renewables went up. We can expect um, lots of arguments over these numbers. I prefer to really take the numbers out um, the, the debate and actually just say the main problem of finance for nuclear is that you have to pay that nearly full cost up front because all your costs essentially are capital costs. Your, your, your operating costs are a, a fraction, 20 or 10% of the uh, capital costs. And so um, 
we don't have a system in society to pay for nuclear. And I think that's really the main problem with nuclear. We can pay for a house. That's a big thing we can pay off. We, we can pay for a football stadium and so on. But when it comes to paying for things that last uh, 60, 80 years, there we do have uh, issues about affording them and it becomes a country scale effort to pay. So nuclear is strongly prejudiced uh, when we don't think big. So um, these then would be <clears throat> just a short thing. I don't want to take too, too long about it, but, but um, the, these issues we have with nuclear would be proliferation. In nuclear, you can detect parts of Avogadro's number, uh, scale um, uh, sensitivity, because there can be um, a radioactive species which um, can be put in sensitive chambers where you can evidence them in, in a large amount of, of other things. And so if there is plutonium and so on around, it's very, very hard not to find it in river water and so on. Also to modify a plant to, to be able to produce it, those kind of things, they, they, they leave a trail. So proliferation is something that can be policed and you can design plant in such a way that you make it almost impossible to do um, uh, 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 nuclear weapons. So, so, so then we can again look at waste and um, I just want to again put this in perspective, Kuburg's lifetime, nearly 40 years now of nuclear waste is in a swimming pool. And, and this shows you how much it is. Fukushima's waste the same. Um, they didn't earthquake harden the swimming pool and that was the biggest release. But this is not a lot of waste and it's not processed waste and waste can be processed and it can have a dramatic volume reduction. And then um, there are technologies on the horizon such as the energy amplifier, which could then retrieve energy from the waste and convert it essentially to safe um, versions of the isotopes of which it is composed. So it is likely that um, we should not see waste really as waste. We should not plan for permanent uh, storage. We should have retrievable storage. We should, um, we should think about things in terms of waste as a resource. And, and going particularly to the scale of waste and processed waste would mean that the entire world's waste would essentially come over a hundred years to a reasonable size that you could get your head around several rugby fields with a, a certain depth of some meters. So, so the waste problem I really think is, is something that we have to think about as scientists and think about as technologists. And, and I believe that that would be solved. I'm thinking of also a finite time of nuclear here because in a hundred years time, the story is going to look very, very, very different. Now also accidents, you know, when it comes to accidents, we, we will swim in, um, in, in an ocean where there possibly could be sharks. We will, we will take a ride in a, in a car where the risk is very, very high. Uh, we will smoke, uh, we will have um, obesity when we know it's very, very dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. So our brain appreciates accidents in, in, in a very subjective way. When you look at risk with numbers, nuclear definitely comes out the safest. For example, if we say to actuaries, what is the chance of falling off your roof when you are working on top of your roof. And that is a number that is known in the industry because it is used to ensure certain workforces. 
And, and so if you took that number and you said, we will now have universal rooftop so solar, then you are going to find that there will be a hundred times more accidents in solar than <clears throat> in, um, in, in, in deaths, I'm talking about, than in nuclear. So, so these, these essentially are how we would look at it. And basically just thinking of nuclear as a hundred year stop gap, very green, uh, not consuming a lot of raw materials of the earth, and after 100 years, a new um, modality could emerge. So in, in, in now, that was a review of the different parts. We would like to look at where is the technology now. And I just also want to say a few things. These large reactors that produce of the order of a gigawatt um, they go to generation three plus where there's all the knowledge gained since Fukushima. Then also have a generation four. Generation four is the walk away safety, the inherent safety, the fail safety, the safety not dependent on human intervention, designed in safety. And you have this other thing of SMR, small modular reactor, 50 to 300 megawatts micro reactors one to 10 megawatts and you have reactors that you fuel every 10 years so i just want you to think about that you know a submarine must come up because of the humans on it not because of the power source a a um a car if you had a car that you fueled once every 10 years instead of once a week or so it, it just gives you the scale this this speaks to the, the, the density of energy uh, stored within a, a nuclear fuel. So, so it seems that we really need to look at this nuclear fuel simply because uh, of something like fuel once every 10 years. There are designs to fuel once every 80 years. So then there's also the concept of process heat. So we in a water scarce uh, environment, we would need to have desalination. So desalination is strongly assisted when the, there's a heat source. And then synthetic fuel carriers, you could imagine a hydrogen economy. These are energy carriers now, you could use them for transport as an alternative to batteries. And, and so the so-called hydrogen economy and the liquid synthetic fuel, and not many people have heard about that. So I just want to say in the liquid synthetic fuel, what we're talking about is taking energy from a green source and there it can be whichever one you like, and then doing essentially photosynthesis. Typically that's done best at high temperature, but you would sequester carbon from carbon dioxide in the air, you would sequester it, okay? And you would take uh, hydrogen from a plentiful source, could be an ocean, and you would make your own synthetic fuel. This obviously you would have cost issues, you would have energy availability issues, but this exists not only in the laboratory, it, it exists um, in installations also where you literally sequester carbon. Basically, you could imagine a planet where you design in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that you want. And if you drive your car, you are part of the cycle of planting a synthetic tree. So um, we, we then um, ask now the question, nuclear energy in the mix, the one that was posed in the very beginning, can it power Africa sustainably? Um, renewables, they're very nice, but they are not dispatchable. They need 100% backup. On average, their load factor is 25%, 30%, depend who you listen to. And they average, therefore, 25% or 30%, even if they average 40%, they don't mind. But that's an average. Their variability 
in that average is 0% to 100%. You got something that averages 40%, but it's 0% to 100%. That's why you need 100% backup. There's going to be that time, like in Texas, in the cold snap a few weeks ago, where the rate of knockout of nuclear power stations was 70% and the other things were closer to 100%, at which, excuse me, to the 0% in operation and they lost their grid. So, so there are times when you will need 100% backup. I would say a few days per year is, is something no one will argue with. But there are a lot of things that you always need to go to the wall and push your finger on the switch and see the light go on. Metaphorically, there are uh, many instances where that is absolutely necessary. So how do you achieve that? You, you must do storage or you must do very, very expensive modalities as in South Africa, we plan open cycle gas turbine or you have the, um, very strong reliance on the grid. But the point is you need that 100% backup. And to be fair, that must also be in the cost. Harvesting this very diffuse resource. And for example, you look at the statistics and you see that China has purchased 97% of rare earth mines on planet earth and a, a big wind turbine can use 20 tons of these rare earths for its um, permanent magnet for when it turns only very slowly. So, so um, one then comes to the question in, on a geological scale, can there be enough lithium for batteries and, and rare earths for, for permanent magnets and so on and so on because you are harvesting a very diffuse resource. And does that scale, can the world use 10 times more power than it does? So uh, renewables require this enormous, enormous plant. I think the conclusion will be, if we're talking on city scale, on country scale, on continent scale, that renewables have their place but not for um, base load generation. And then you look at your uh, carbon free dispatchable alternatives. You have hydro and you have nuclear. Um, I think I've got a little time, so I might look at the hydro for Africa. But the, the, the nuclear uh, you could do, the, it's off the shelf now. And the, the, the hydro, there is um, uh, that potential, the, the, but then you must think carefully about it. So there's this Grand Inga hydropower project, some views of the river there. I think if you, if you look at the left-hand view, there's a, this fork in the river. It's the dream of a dam builder. It means you could dam the one branch and you would still have the natural flow in the other branch. And so this could have a lower uh, ecological impact. And um, if it was a run of river, it would be 39 gigawatts. If it was dammed, uh, then it would go up a lot. So I think there's an acceptance that uh, Grand Inga could be the, the largest hydropower project. It's the world's most potent potential hydropower project. But then you would come into issues of a grid that went across many African states. There would be issues of security of supply. You would still have concerns about the damming of a river. Is that what nature wants us to do with rivers? once you have dammed a river, is the role of that dam to be a battery, to be a generator, or should it be to 
improve the ecology of the system. For example, you've seen the Kabora Baza Dam and the Mozambican Delta and using the dam in, in a power context is essentially leading to floods. So, so this is um, again important. So I just want people to, to see, yes, there is hydropower, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that this is going to save us. So I want to end here with um, this conclusion that um, when we look at carbon-free dispatchable alternatives, nuclear again proposes itself. And so uh, we, we do really need to look at this and we need to understand more deeply what are the requirements of renewables. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon, for uh, for a very thorough <laughs> presentation and uh, and some really interesting uh, facts that, uh, that 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 you listed there. And um, I, I would like now to 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 invite Thomas and uh, and, and Jared, maybe who are uh, on, on the panel, to invite them to to ask questions <laughs> and and start uh, a discussion since we have still uh, around fifteen minutes. And, uh, and then I would like to ask Thomas um, to, to give a look at the Q&A and, um, and share with us the questions that the, that the audience has. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Thank you, uh, thank Simon. You. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. And um, yeah, so I opened the session for the, for the panel. Um, um, Maybe, you know, I mean, there, there have been many questions on the chat and we can actually start with some of them uh, because they are um, kind of also the questions that, that I would ask. Uh, and um, yeah, the first question I see here is the question of uh, how to prevent nuclear reactor accidents like Fukushima or Chernobyl. I don't necessarily see um, Fukushima as something that's been interpreted by society correctly. So if I can just say that before I mention how to pre prevent it. Up to now, even if you take people who strongly anti-nuclear, there's not a claim of a death by nuclear. I think the one fireman recently passed away who got a 250 millisievert dose and he had refused to wear boots when he waded in uh, to the internals. And apart from that, they distributed um, uh, iodine pills in, in well in advance and there were not instances of thyroid cancer. The deaths uh, related to Fukushima are dominated by people who committed suicide because they were moved. There was a large release. It was um, about 10% the size of the Chernobyl release. It was mostly due, but dominated, I think, by more than 90% of the, the leaking and then um, melting uh, of, of the spent fuel pool, which was not radiation hardened. In terms of the actual reactor, there's been a very, very small release. The other thing Fukushima showed us is there was nowhere to hide. At the time of Fukushima, I was teaching in uh, essentially reactor physics or nuclear engineering. And a, a lot of companies could see that on the web. And I got sent many codes that were making predictions of what happened at Fukushima from the, the fingerprint. So there were Russians who detected some of the release. There were other people who saw ratios between isotopes of plutonium in another part of release. Dotted around, there was some information from TEPCO of temperatures at some places. On, on, on the reactor vessel. And those could be seen as boundary conditions to put into the code and see an inverse problem. What was the condition of the core? And there was a tremendous agreement that TEPCO was not revealing everything and that there had been a meltdown. So I, I think that Fukushima showed you cannot hide. 
you, you absolutely cannot hide and people can reconstruct. And there's now this new field of forensic modeling of nuclear reactors. And the large amount of deaths of 20,000 people that came from um, uh, uh, the, the, the um, tidal wave. So there were people who were in a bullet train and they all died. And the, these people that they um, were traveling in the bullet train, they availed themselves of a very, very um, uh, high technology facility and it caused them to die. So then you, you may say, no, we're not supposed to have such modern things as nuclear energy, you can die, but then you also should not have a bullet train, you should have ridden in a horse cart. So, so <clears throat> again, I wouldn't have, I think that, that history is going to actually class Fukushima as not being as serious. And then we will class uh, Chernobyl as being the most serious. Then Chernobyl we will see as generation two with very, very poor safety and, and, um, and, and <clears throat> um, yes, so, so I definitely think it's very unlikely we'll ever see another Chernobyl and also the layers of safety that are instituted since Fukushima are, are very, very much more. Three Mile Island, I think would be considered as a recovered accident. Um, other accidents like wind scale and so on, I think will also be seen in a similar way. And then um, overall, I think we will start to find the numbers on nuclear are very safe, but, but, but um, our minds will blow that up because, because we do not uh, understand the risk. We, we, we do not appreciate it. It's like the COVID virus. It's there. Are we exposed to it or are we not when, when there's radiation? Because we cannot see this. So, and, and the measures that we take against COVID are similar to what we take against nuclear. They're informed by science but they're not part necessarily of our uh, intuition. Yeah, Simon, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, uh, in the meantime, I, I, I just want to say, I mean, there has been reports by the, um, by the WHO um, saying that uh, the, uh, the risk of, uh, of steroid cancer uh, rose by 70%. Uh, and uh, and other numbers. So, uh, do you do you do you think that is exaggerated? I mean, Sarah Kansan near Fukushima. Yeah, I mean, I I looked very recently to try and overview all of the evidence. I mean, every so often I re-examine all of the Chernobyl evidence, all of the Fukushima evidence, and try to come to a a answer on this. And, and generally one finds that it's very hard to, to assess the, the risks that also are lifestyle risks. I think that's very, very hard. And, and so one, one ends up having to go with some kind of, of path to, to really um, be fair to the different modalities. So even if you say, yes, we, 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 are, we are going to allow that um, nuclear has a certain accident rate, you would have to apply a similar rate to other modalities. For example, um, if I take, let's say solar, then there must be the production of silicon and steel and aluminium and other raw materials, and these must be mined, and there are fatalities in the mine, which we are blind to. But when you put them in and you compare them even to worst case nuclear, nuclear still comes out less. Then such okay. an accident, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. I'm just okay. saying. I, yeah, good, um, uh, that's fine. I just want to uh, give Jared the other uh, panel member the opportunity to ask a question. He's he's showing his hand, Jared. Yeah, hi. Um, good morning, and um, for the talk of of Gunnar. 
Um, I just wanted to really address a few themes that have come through in some of the Q&A, because um, there's been a lot of questions, but there's one or two themes, so maybe just two. And the one is around sort of the long-term waste topic and um, how that can be dealt with. Uh, one of the questions that came through here is how do we deal with nuclear waste over the long term? Um, the question phrased, storing it in a swimming pool and burying it does not sound sustainable to me. That seems more like a comment on the question. There's one or two others that also relate to that. So maybe you could address that uh, around the nuclear waste topic and the long-term sustainability thereof. Um, there's also um, another question towards the end here around the sort of national, I guess, policy environment around nuclear and the integrated resource plan inclusion of nuclear versus not inclusion of nuclear. I think you have addressed this throughout, but probably an important question to answer in the bigger picture of South Africa's long-term energy mix and where it's possibly heading towards. Um, so those two key questions, maybe if there's time, you could answer another one around fuel. Uh, there's a question around nuclear fuel and using uh, possibly other types of, of, of nuclear fuel. I think it was here around thorium. Um, maybe just those two and the third one, if there's time. Thanks. So I think that in, in the, the long-term disposal of waste, when you have uranium as a source, uh, then there are isotopes which go to a very, very long term. But there are technologies to process the waste, which bring it down and then reduce the volume of what has the long term when something has a very, very long lifetime, it also won't have a very high thermal output. So you can appreciate um, as you go to longer lifetimes, the, the risk from a, from a, a thermal context, uh, needing cooling and so on, gets less and less and less. Now, typically it's thought in the industry that the time of storage would be 300 years with a easily achievable processing. And then the amount of radioactivity would be equivalent of a natural rock. Na natural rock has the uranium and thorium decay series and also potassium. And so there's a certain amount of radioactivity already in nature. So, so when you talk about final storage, you, you don't want to get to zero, you want to get to nature. And, and so then you, you can reach that in the hundreds of years with um, a certain amount of processing. And, and I also wanted to say, um, there is now a major European project uh, which is being constructed in Hungary and that will, produce, that will pursue a, a, a one, one of these routes will be the first, um, I would say, lab scale look at the technologies to quieten down nuclear waste from a nuclear perspective and not saying chemically isolating and so on as the other methods, but transmuting the nuclei in waste uh, for, for which the nuclear physics um, shows this is possible. So it, it's an accelerator driven technology and it's exothermic and uh, is regarded to pay for itself, if I can say. So, so I think from a scientific and technical point of view, no one is scared of nuclear waste, literally. I, I really think so. Um, when it comes to a thorium system, thorium doesn't give you as much um, uh, isotopes beyond uranium. And so thorium just looks absolutely fantastic from the waste perspective. When you ask why did we go the uranium route and not the thorium route, it boils down to the military who wanted to produce weapons, which they could do in the uranium route. Then because it's so difficult to uh, regulate nuclear, the, it, the requirements are so stringent. A lot of the development costs is achieving this regulation and it is a immensely slowed down thorium. Whereas uranium, which got in there 
ahead of the pack because of the, the military um, potential, uh, we ended up, you know, being stuck with uranium. And the, the third question you'll have to remind me of, Jared. Uh, the third question was really just around the sort of energy policy discussion and technology choices in the energy mix. Um, it was one from one of the questioners. Yes. Was, this is and Charlie Charlie, just around how uh, the comment was energy policy seems to be shifting away from nuclear, um, evidenced in the RP, uh, and that it was included in a policy adjusted scenario. Um, yes, actually, um, other countries have, have done nuclear closeout mm. programs whilst we might be going towards nuclear in, in some respects. Yes. So people, I would say, are nuts about renewables. And we talk about um, percentage improvements in solar power. We talk about efficiencies of percentage improvements in wind turbines. We see farms going up when people are happy when they put in 200 megabytes, mega uh, um, uh, watts. That, that is, someone will celebrate when they put in 200 megawatts. And, and so even though there's a lot of noise about it and, and wanting to go towards, I don't know, 50, 60, 70% penetration of renewables into the mix, there's very, very, very little progress. And when you talk to people who are actually involved in generation and transmission, they're really worried about the price increase, really, really worried. I think the trade unions are becoming sensitized to the fact of hidden costs of renewable. And I think when you, when you, when you actually, uh, ask the question, what is giving nuclear a bad reputation? What if the things could be the, the uh, corruption that was associated with the previous administration? <clears throat> but that same corruption's not necessarily disappeared because you still have a president strongly renewable and brothers-in-law strongly renewable, heavily invested. So you would still raise the issue about conflicts of interest and is nuclear getting a fair hearing and why is there not a big impact of of Cuba costing 45 cents a kilowatt hour why is this not a big impact and mostly when I look at the conversation I don't see people saying safety and waste and proliferation I don't see that most of the argument is around cost and an, an assumption that, that um, renewables are green and not acknowledging the greenness of nuclear. So, so um, I think the, the debate isn't an informed debate. The debate, I, I think is, it's in South Africa, it's main protagonists, Yelland, uh, Eberhard, um, so on. These are people who pushed a similar line uh, for, for, for decades and they're never going to change. I uh, don't think any logic is going to convince um, people uh, who, who are so strongly invested in a, almost a journalistic path of a certain conversation. And I think it's very sad for uh, South Africa that we, we don't have a nuclear conversation. When you talk to nuclear people, they actually are very reticent to involve in the conversation to the level of, let's say, the, the, the renewables, because there's such terrible um, press. And, and so nuclear, nonetheless, it's powered along in an academic sense to the extent that you have small modular reactors now you have micro reactors, you have the walk away safety, um, um, uh, big, bigger reactors. So, so <clears throat> if I can put it like this, um, I, I don't know how um, informed our audience is, let's say in physics, but, but if, if I put it like this, you, a cross section, 
as we normally experience it in physics, it's, it's a very pure concept. It's, it encapsulates the fundamental physics of a process. Now, um, in a nuclear reactor concept, concept, context, they talk about a macroscopic cross-section. And this is a number which has got temperature, um, <clears throat> a, a variance to, to, to temperature. And that is because if we normally talk about cross sections, it's in the center of mass frame. And if we think of a neutron approaching a nucleus and it's a, a near thermal neutron, uh, then <clears throat> the motion of the, the uranium atom is, must be taken into account even in the lab, it is not stationary. And there's an effect of Doppler broadening then on, on the um, energy available in the center of mass. So the cross section will become thermally averaged and, and large resonances will broaden. And this, this effect changes the response of a reactor. A reactor then knows its temperature in a physics sense. A reactor knows what its temperature is. Most of the time <clears throat> you can uh, use this thermal effect and they, they build it into a concept of a reactivity. So it's a, it will be a thermal component of the reactivity and you can make it negative. You can design it in that it will shut the reactor down. In other words, by physics, you can make the reactor shut down because of temperature. I think if you just think about that, it doesn't need a human. It can exceed a given design temperature and it can shut down. You can have a terrorist come in and kill all the operators <clears throat> and then instigate a chain of events that should make the reactor overheat, but it won't get there. It's going to shut down. And then you just simply design in an engineering way all the components that they withstand uh, the temperature excursion until this shutdown happens. And that is actually easily achievable. This is the basis of most of the walk away inherent safety. In fact, um, you operate the reactor near the shutdown temperature, the reactor becomes very hard to start and, and the reactor cannot overheat. So, so when, you, when you do uh, look at nuclear, literally um, there are designs and there are technologies that you can remove uh, these nuclear nightmares, each one of them. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Simon. thank you. Yeah. Ah, sorry, sorry, Thomas, sorry. you go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Simon, thank you very much. I mean, there is uh, still many questions open, and uh, maybe let me uh, let me close uh, by saying that uh, you know, or asking you whether you would agree that uh, that we can actually just do it in terms of numbers. So we could look at the least cost scenario uh, for the best energy mix and and decide it on on this, these grounds. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, but but. Don't forget the aspects of dispatchability. Yes, sure, of course. And that must be factored in. So there must be kind of the, the capacity must be factored in. And that leads me over to the talk that we will hear uh, next uh, Friday um, by Dr. Jared Wright, who is going to talk uh, about uh, the energy mix, the best energy mix, as I understand it, um, from, from an energy systems perspective. So um, I think, I hope that, uh, uh, that you will come again and, um, and maybe we can continue our discussion. And Simon, thank you very much again. I uh, give over to Francesco to say the final words. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for a very uh, informative talk that uh, really opened uh, our eyes on some serious issues. And, and I would really like to thank also Jared and, and, and Thomas um, for, their, for their comments and for their assistance in, in, in moderating the question and of course all the, all the audience. And as Thomas uh, indicated next week, uh, Dr. Jared Wright will, will speak 
and maybe give us a slightly different perspective on the same uh, on the same issue. And and Simon is of course invited to, to join us as well, and uh, and and uh, and give us his his comment of on on, on that uh, point of view. But uh, uh, I'm really encouraged that uh, you know it seems that uh, we had a really nice audience this morning with lots of uh, really interesting questions, and and maybe we should try to to to. Um, uh, to, to invite other speakers to, 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 to speak about this topic. Yeah? Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, in, the, in the talk of, of Simon, he, he addressed the long-term perspectives of the energy. But we have also some uh, very, <laughs> uh, very acute short-term problems in our energy, energy mix. Yeah? So maybe we need to find also uh, in the near future a speaker who can address uh, how, to, how to improve the situation on a, on, on a short term. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Simon, again for, for your time and for preparing uh, a very nice uh, uh, presentation. And um, I wish you all uh, a good day. Hopefully, <laughs> the electricity will come back today at some stage for all of you. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm looking forward to continue this discussion uh, next week. And thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you very much, Jared, for, for joining us as well this morning. And thank you to Ilya, who is the traditional co-host of, uh, of these events. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a, have a good day. And you will receive later today the announcement of the talk by Jared next week. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.